protect your DNA. BioPQQ can promote formation of new mitochondria. InfoWarsStore.com As people were waiting to see what was going to happen after the verdict of the grand jury was released, whether there was going to be looting and rioting, those with OathKeepers.org were on the ground organizing. Twice before, they had seen the governor of Missouri pull out the National Guard troops, pull out the protection, and let people riot. They knew that would happen again, so they began working together, putting a team together, and they were very effective at protecting some local businesses there. We're going to talk to Stuart Rhodes, the founder of Oath Keepers, as well as Sam Andrews, the person who put together the local team there in Ferguson, Missouri. Stuart, I think most of our viewers know about Oath Keepers, but for those who don't, give us a little bit of information about your origin and your mission statement. Well, we are, as we're both current serving and former military police and first responders. And the mission of Oath Keepers is to remind all of us who took the oath, whether we're current serving or, or retired, of our obligations and duties to defend the Constitution. And a big wake-up call for a lot, was, was, a lot of folks was the gun confiscation during Hurricane Katrina, the use of emergency to set aside the Bill of Rights and set aside our rights. And we're seeing the same thing right now in Ferguson. You're seeing the, the government's giving the folks there a false choice. On the one hand, they are, you know, Violating the rights of peaceful protesters, we did it back in August. It's also happening again now. But on the other hand, they're not stopping the actual looting. And we saw this back in August, and we saw it the first night here in, in uh, Ferguson. And we already kind of got uh, kind of tipped to the grapevine that, that they're not going to protect the people. And so we rallied our guys early Monday morning and got the word out for volunteers to go down and guard the buildings, to guard, to guard the business owners. And this is the sad thing, is that just like the Korean shop owners back in, in the Rodney King riots back in the 90s, um, they were abandoned by the police as well. And here, the, the Ferguson police and, and St. Louis police and also the National Guard have simply failed to protect the shop owners. And our, our team has been able to, over two nights' time, prevent the strip mall that they're guarding, which has a black-owned business, uh, a business owned by a white person, and then two Asian businesses, you know, multicultural. They guarded those four businesses and, and prevented them from being burned down. And that was the whole point, is for us to lead by example and show the people there is a third way. The third way is you occupy the buildings, you protect your own, you, you protect the, the property owners who are vulnerable to arson. You don't leave the, the streets open to the arsonists. In the end, you protect the people first and foremost. Without doing that, what's the point? What's exactly. The serving if not protecting people. We had uh, we had an interview last night with a, uh, a firefighter with many years' experience, a former fire chief, and he pointed out that a lot of these small businesses are going to find that they're not insured for riots, just like they don't uh, they have exceptions in people's insurance clauses for war. A lot of these people are going to be permanently put out of business, even if. They had an insurance policy that's going to pay to rebuild their business. They're going to be without income, without a livelihood for quite a while. And a lot of people don't have that kind of uh, uh, backup plan where they can withstand the amount of time that they're going to be without an income. I want to go to uh, Sam Andrews. You mentioned how you guys got together on the ground and you protected uh, some businesses there, uh, offering them private security. Sam, you were the one who was organizing that locally there in Ferguson. Tell us a little bit about what uh, happened there. I read a one account of it. You said that uh, they could not afford to hire private security. They didn't have the means to do it themselves. When you guys offered to volunteer, they had tears in their eyes. Yes, in fact, uh, I am a local businessman here in St. Louis, and I run a small business, and so it's very difficult to be in a cash flow situation of a small business and have these sort of overwhelming events occur. Mm -hmm. You just don't have the resources to bring in people. That's right. And when I approached these people and offered them security, uh, they literally broke down in tears and were like, thank you so much. We need so much help. And I don't understand why Governor Nixon is not helping us. And it, it, was, uh, it was quite the emotional reaction. And it was part relief and part joy and, uh, and part just shock from the tragedy, I think. Tell us a little bit about what you've seen there from your perspective. We've had some reporters on the ground uh, this week. They, they were back. They were there in August. Uh, they were there all week uh, last week awaiting the decision. Of course, they were there as things were being set on fire on uh, Monday night, Tuesday night. Uh, I believe they had some contact with some of your guys that uh, basically offered them some backup. Uh, but give us your perspective on uh, what's going on there as somebody who's, who's witnessed it. 
quickly the first night, there was a huge mistake made by Governor Nixon. He put a number of resources guarding the wealthier institutions, you know, Clayton City Hall and the Federal Reserve and mm -hmm. downtown and, and businesses, and left the small business person, which is literally the demographic of Ferguson itself, left it to the dogs. I mean, Nixon threw that town into the fire. And with these arsonists running around, they had months to prepare. We had plenty of resources here in the state of Missouri. There was no reason why they shouldn't have had five guardsmen on every block protecting the small businesses. It, the first time around, if you get caught out, I understand. But this time around, the first night, those guys should have been in place ready to go at the announcement. Which and makes me... Which makes me and a lot of other people skeptical. This isn't something that they've been wanting to happen. They're immediately talking about a race war. We've had a lieutenant general pining about uh, calling in the Insurrection Act. Every single step of this from the very beginning, it seems to me, they have done things to inflame tensions rather than to step them down, concluding with the grand jury, using a grand jury, not having an open trial, and then the way that it was uh, announced, uh, doing it after dark when they had always had the riots begin in the past. It seems to me everything was calculated to get just this type of reaction. I think you're absolutely right. In fact, Sam, tell them about your encounter with the National Guard the other day. Well, I had an interesting encounter the other day with the National Guard. You know, we had uh, secured the permission of all the businesses in the two buildings that we had the manpower to help. We, The owners of the businesses and the owner of the building had all agreed that they wanted us for security. So when we arrived on scene, I liaisoned with a sergeant that was in the National Guard and uh, then walked back to the business, the, the building owner's son, who was a dentist there, and I was speaking with him about the plan for the evening. And at that point, not 15 minutes after I talked to the sergeant in the guard, the, the owner of the building, the dentist's mother, called and said, the National Guard wants to put people on our roof. Should we let them do that? Mm -hmm. And uh, I overheard the statement, and he looked at me, and I shook my head, no, don't do that. And he, he told his mother, no, please, don't. We have a team here, and, and, and we want them on the roof. We don't want the National Guard on the roof. And I just thought it was an amazing coincidence that uh, the moment we, they realized we were operating in the area, they tried to preempt us yeah. and take our position away from us. And I, and I bet you, Sam, they would have put somebody there, they would have left them there for a while, and then they would have called them and said, relocate, and left the building after they had determined that you were not going to be there. I, I would imagine that's what's going to happen. We've seen over and over again that uh, businesses who, A, depended on law enforcement or the National Guard to protect them, they're the ones now who have lost their businesses. Uh, we see that uh, in many cases, they relied on their connections with the community. They felt a connection. They put up signs that said they were in support of uh, Michael Brown or whatever. They didn't believe uh, that there, this would happen to them. They said, we trust the people in our community. But it wasn't necessarily the people in their community. For the most part, it could have very well been people outside the community. They did not take it upon themselves to protect their own stuff. And that's really what the Second Amendment is about. I think your mere presence there is a deterrent. And that's an important aspect of our rights under the Second Amendment, having people who are armed, and showing that that can stand down something, just as uh, they've talked many years about having a nuclear deterrent or whatever as a, as a deterrent to war. And we don't need to get into that. But, but I think having the arms there, people seeing that, I think that can stand down violence. Hey, Sam, did you ever see any, Sam, did you ever see any National Guard on any roof anywhere in Ferguson? No, not at all. But last night, buildings right. 70 yards to the north of us were lit on fire and buildings to the south of us were lit on fire, but they didn't want to challenge 10 to 20 men with suppressed weapons in Absolutely. a high position. It's they decided not to light those buildings on fire. I guess you could call it luck. It was just, you know, <laughs> just that evening, but yeah. I don't think so. No, it's a deterrent, and you didn't have, it, it, it didn't require you to take any shots. They just saw that you were capable of protecting yourself, and they stood down, and then they took the targets of opportunity. We saw this happen during the L.A. riots, where the only people who didn't get burned down in, in neighborhoods were the ones who were there guarding their own stores. In many cases, they were doing it themselves with their own weapons. I really... We have highly, we have highly trained people here on yes. this operation, and we have a lot of resources. We have less lethal options. We, have, um, we had water and fire extinguishers on the roofs. 
uh, we, I mean, we were prepared for the arsonist. Mm-hmm. And there isn't any way to approach any of those buildings without being triangulated immediately with lethal force and non-lethal force. Well, that's the difference, is that you've got, as you pointed out, some uh, trained professionals with experience. Tell us a little bit about, uh, are you still looking for people that uh, could meet up with you and need help? Do you want to put out a call while you've got the, uh, uh, the phone here as to what you're looking for and where they could meet you? We're always looking ahead, for Jeff. highly skilled people. And on this type of an operation, it's an extremely dangerous and volatile situation. And the protesters like to taunt you while you're working. And it takes a very mature individual with a lot of training and a lot of wisdom to have the patience not to engage with people like that. Yes. It, yeah. it's, it's, not a, it's not a great thing for a 20-year-old militia member, but somebody in special operations or someone that has years of SWAT training and knows how to act as a professional and knows what the standards are and the use of force laws of the state are can always be useful in those situations. I'm looking down your uh, skills set and experience that you're looking for in an Ammo Land uh, article, and I always noticed that uh, a lot of these, of course, are people, as you're describing, who had experience in law enforcement and the military. But then, of course, you're also looking for photographers or cameramen. You're also looking for private drone operators to be your eye in the sky. So there might be uh, opportunities for people who don't have uh, military training to join up with uh, Oath Keepers in a supportive role there in this particular situation. Yes, a skilled cameraman uh, that has ballistic protection and has uh, an array of lithium batteries to run his photography equipment in really cold weather Mm -hmm. um, would be extremely useful. We just didn't have that last night or the night before. But if we could find someone that had that ability and that equipment and they and they had some tactical experience and wouldn't be just another objective to guards sucking up our resources, they would be extremely useful. Okay, good. Uh, let me give, uh, about out of time, let me give uh, Stuart Rhodes the uh, last word. Stuart, what would you like to uh, tell the audience? Well, it's certainly important, as Sam said, for this operation, we want only the best train we can possibly get. But what you said earlier is also true. The Korean shop owners in L.A., everybody out there has a responsibility, the duty to prepare to protect their own property and their own neighbors. And we want, we want to see as Americans get trained up and improve the skill set of all Americans. That's why we have our, our community preparedness teams, a project with the Oath Keepers, to go and train people in, in four neighborhood watches and do exactly what we're doing here. It shouldn't take guys from across the country to go secure Ferguson. The people of Ferguson and the folks from Missouri should have it handled. That's what we want to see is more Americans stepping up and taking responsibility for each other and helping each other. And it's not about threatening lethal force. The guys, they would just put flashlights on them, let them know they were there, and mm-hmm. without exception, they decided to go someplace else. So it's, it's a major deterrent just the presence alone. Exactly. And that's the way we would like to see the police wisely invo- engage people. And unfortunately, it doesn't always turn out that way. I think people are getting the message. We've seen gun purchases up hundreds of percent in that area. They understand that the government is not going to protect them, that they have to do that themselves. And of course, uh, they're selling the guns and trying to get people interested in learning how to use them. I think people are going to be very interested in that. And I think that you're going to have uh, a role to play in that in Oath Keepers in that area. I think there's going to be a lot of new gun owners that need some training so that they can use this safely and effectively. And I think uh, I expect to see Oath Keepers involved in that in many ways as well. Well, one last point is that the right way to do it, it should be stress for the police. This is what we did uh, eight, three months ago. The way to do it is to have what you, what you would call a strong point matrix defense. They are on the rooftops, in the shops, spread out, and then they could have, the one to arrest somebody, they could have their arrest teams inside the shops, ready to go, hidden from the, the arsonists. So flip the paradigm. Instead of you mm-hmm. trying to find these arsonists, like a and a needle, haystack, you know, needle in the haystack, instead it's the other way around. They don't know where the eyes are on them. They go to try to burn a building and bam, they get arrested. That's the way to do it right without violating the rights of peaceful protesters. Well, and of course, we could, and we have been throughout this week talking about why didn't they do this? Why didn't they do that? And, and the mistakes and the continuing mistakes, even after people have pointed that out, standing down the National Guard as uh, they've done before and now they've done it again, even not protecting the uh, fire department as they were going in to put out a fire. As one of the reporters said to the uh, police uh, chief there, 
isn't it standard operating procedure that the police would go in and, and secure these areas and have the backs of the fire department? And he goes, yeah, that's standard procedure, but it didn't have, you know. I mean, it's just, it's amazing to see what they're doing there. And again, we have to ask, is this gross incompetence or is this something where they would like to see a race war evolve because it would suit their purposes? Thank you so much for talking to us, uh, Stuart Rhodes with Oath Keepers and Sam Andrews, who is the local Oath Keepers there in Ferguson, Missouri. They have been helping people, guarding their businesses, doing it for free, and showing people that that's the right way to just stand down this violence, is to let people know that you're there. It doesn't require a violent confrontation, but our responsibility to protect ourselves is our responsibility. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Adam and Andrews, for what you're doing there. I appreciate that. Thank you. All right, welcome. Thank you. And again, if you don't have the right skills or you can't make it to the area, you can still support that Ferguson security team. They have a donation fund set up. Go to OathKeepers.org, and you'll see the button there where you can help to support that operation, help them to support people in Ferguson. Well, that's it for our news tonight. If you're watching this on YouTube and you're not a subscriber, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. And if you're not a subscriber to Prison Planet TV, your donation will allow you to watch the news every weeknight at 7 Central, 8 p.m. Eastern. It will also help to support our operation. You can share it with up to 20 of your friends and family. They can watch the news as it's happening and have access to all of Alex Jones's documentaries. Join us weeknights, 7 Central, 8 p.m. Eastern. Another major health threat, this one in Toledo, Ohio, where everybody in the entire city has been told not to drink the water. Ohio's governor declaring a state of emergency. Did you know that the average person uses about 80 to 100 gallons of water at home every single day? If there's a water emergency, will you be prepared? Panicked residents forming long lines throughout the day. We're here at a supermarket in Toledo. You can see the shelves empty where water once was. To stay safe and healthy during a crisis, you must must have access to safe, clean water. Water which will not be available at your local grocery store. There's a mad dash on right now to stock up on supplies. The ProPure Pro 1 G2.0 water filtration system is a must have for every modern, independently minded household. Protect your family's safety during an emergency. Go to InfoWarsStore.com today to purchase your ProPure Pro 1 G2.0 water filtration system or call 1-88-253-3139. You are watching the InfoWars Nightly News, which airs 7 p.m. Central at InfoWarsNews.com. Members can share their passcodes with up to 11 other people, and your support is helping us defend liberty worldwide.